Hello, I'd like to speak to you about your environmental law course, um, some comments in relation to resources and research skills. The course is primarily built around the text Environmental Law in Australia by Jerry Bates. That's available through LexisNexis and you should all have that textbook. That's the eighth edition that I'm showing you there. The assessment requires you to critically consider legislation, case law and legal principles. So you will need to develop some good legal research skills if you haven't already done so. During the course of this discussion, I'll talk to you about some of those sources uh, where you might consider obtaining some good up-to-date legal research material. The course itself, as you probably are aware by now, is designed to be interactive. We do use UCRU extensively, and I would encourage you, perhaps through UCRU, to set up some study groups. I think that might help you on your way through. I will provide you with some further commentary in relation to the particular legal writing style that I like, but I will emphasise that I do like to have material appropriately referenced. And um, obviously you need to be aware of issues in relation to plagiarism and ensure that you don't fall into any traps in that regard. As much as possible, I would like to have this course adopt a practical rather than theoretical flavour to it. The text is very practical in the way it's written. Uh, the excellent notes which are prepared by Dr Lawson Smith, which you'll find on Moodle, have a more theoretical flavour to them. I would like you to attempt the various study modules which you'll um, find uh, each week. I don't think you'll find them particularly difficult, um, but I would like them to form the basis of the discussions. And those particular questions relate to your reading through Jerry Bates. Do try to stay in advance. The course is designed to ensure that you do your reading and do your work before we get to the weekly sessions through Zoom. There may be guest speakers, and you'll see already in Moodle some reference to guest speakers um, who can provide some valuable commentary in relation to the material involving environmental law. I'd commend you particularly to um, guest speakers, uh, which include uh, Judge Morzone. He was uh, Dean Morzone QC at the time I prepared the lecture. Uh, judge Morzone is uh, a judge of the District Court of Queensland. And you'd be aware that the Planning and Environment Court is really essentially an adjunct to the District Court. So his is um, very important uh, viewing. I'd, re I'd refer you to the commentaries by Roger Curry, who's an environmental activist, and he's um, made some very interesting comments. Um, very importantly, have a look at the uh, discussions that I have with Rod Litster QC, who was actually one of the senior counsel involved in the Predijon case, Predijon against uh, Cairns Regional Council. So that's very interesting reading uh, or viewing. And there's viewing uh, also, amongst others, from Phil Jeston, who's an environmental scientist, and that's worth, um, worth a look. Um, Phil goes in to discuss environmental impact assessment and uh, statements. So there will be guest speakers uh, from time to time, and please watch, the, watch out for those. Now, at this stage, you're probably grappling with how to cope with different platforms. We do use different modes of communication. It's one of the advantages of an online system. And because we have this online system, uh, you have the advantage of having direct access to course coordinators and guest lecturers, such as, as we've, we've identified judges and QCs. And certainly back in the 70s, when I did my study at the University of Queensland, we didn't have any guest speakers, let alone judges or QCs, come and speak with us. So you've got some real advantages. But it does require some juggling. You need to think about how you're going to juggle the reading material through the text, the online resources, the case law, the legislation, Moodle, UCRU, email and forums. There is a risk of overload, of course. Do I apologise? I don't, I'm sorry. Um, people say, well, shouldn't this be presented in one neat, homogenous package? Well, the answer is no, because part of your experience in coming into the law is dealing with a multitude of different programs and different sources of material. In fact, what you're experiencing during the course of study is essentially a taste. Um, in reality, there's much more 
in terms of uh, what you need to cope with uh, in terms of volume and different sources. One way that we can keep this uh, tied together is through the weekly Zoom sessions. As you would have seen in previous uh, communications, I'm very keen for you to involve yourself in those Zoom sessions. And I do um, encourage you to collaborate. It's an important pas part of the course. Uh, that can be done through Zoom and Ucrew, Moodle and um, study groups. So I think you'll be disappointed if you don't try to collaborate and if you don't engage with your fellow students and with me. You might come into the course with um, no prior knowledge, but don't think that that means you have nothing to, uh, to offer. I would totally disagree, and I think many students are in the same situation. They're coming in with perhaps some, but very basic knowledge, and um, the interaction of students is a great way to learn. At the start, you might be thinking, well, there's so much to cover. How do I deal with everything at once? Well, I guess the answer is that you just go as hard as you can. Um, I've made reference to one of the non-prescribed texts, which is a practical guide to legal research um, in the material. And I'll just quote from that. And uh, in that text, it says, legislation is central to legal problem solving. Legislation is the largest source of law in Australia and forms the basis of the Australian legal system. Indeed, almost every area of law is influenced by Commonwealth or state and territory legislation or a combination of both. As law is constantly changing with many laws enacted and existing laws amended each year, it is essential for students, lawyers and other professionals not only to have an understanding of the area of law, but, but also how to locate, update and interpret relevant legislation. So keep that in mind. I think it's a very apposite quote. And also um, in the first paragraph of chapter three of that particular text, which as I said is non-prescribed, I'm not suggesting that you rush out and buy it if you don't already have it, although it is useful. Um, a quote, the following quote is useful. In a common law system such as Australia, case law is central to understanding, interpreting and applying the law. And like legislation, cases provide the necessary, necessary authority in support of a particular legal principle or proposition. It is imperative, therefore, that law students and lawyers can research, locate and update case law. One of the core principles of common law systems is the, the doctrine of stare decisis, which translates approximately to follow precedent and do not disturb things which are settled. So according to the doctrine of precedent, a court, and therefore law students and legal professionals, should follow decided cases or precedents on the same subject. As a primary source of our law, identifying, reading and understanding cases is integral to legal research. Paramount to this is a sound understanding of the Australian judicial hierarchy and doctrine of precedent, which determines the authority for decisions in a particular jurisdiction. So we take from that, that while legislation is the main source of our law, and will override the common law or judge-made law, it is important that you understand that courts, through their decided decisions, um, do um, have an influence in, and role to play in the making of law. Not every decision of a court or tribunal is binding on later courts or tribunals. There is a hierarchy. So, for example, decisions of the High Court are binding on all other courts and tribunals. Decisions of the Supreme Court of a particular state are not binding on the High Court. Decisions of a magistrate's court in a state are not binding on the district court and so on. But the reverse generally will apply. And that is that a court or tribunal will be bound on a point of law decided by a court higher up in the uh, hierarchy. Now resources. Uh, I mentioned that the primary resource will be the text, Environmental Law in Australia by Jerry Bates. That's an excellent text and that's the one that you should be concentrating your reading on. But apart from that, there are some other very good texts. For example, um, while it is at the time of preparing this to be superseded, Sustainable Planning in Queensland by Philippa England, which is Federation Press, is excellent. There are some other publications that might be uh, worth having a look at. Environment and Sustainability, a policy handbook. 
there is the um, uh, case summaries uh, book by LexisNexis. And one that I particularly like, um, and it's quite inexpensive to purchase, is the Community Litigants Handbook. And this is by Onita O'Hart. And it's um, published by the Environmental Defender's Office. And that's um, very practical and worth a look. Apart from that, of course, we have the online legal resources by Dr. Lawson Smith that I've mentioned. There are online resources through LexisNexis and Thomson Reuters. They're excellent. And I've already made reference to non-prescribed texts, The New Lawyer by James and Field, and A Practical Guide to Legal Research by Sanderson and Kelly. Um, that's from Wiley and Thomson Reuters, respectively. Then they're prescribed textbooks for the first year of um, um, introduction to law in the LLB course. Now, online material. You need to have a look at Ostley. A-U-S-T-L-I-I. -I. Um, that's one way to access legislation and case law. It's not authorised, but it's very good and it's very user-friendly. Alternatively, you can have a look at Comlaw for Commonwealth legislation and uh, have a look at the Australian Guide to Legal Citation if you want to know about the way in which lawyers are required to reference material. Now, some key legislation. Firstly, we have the... Um, Commonwealth, uh, in that jurisdiction, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act of 1999. Uh, typically, that will be referred to through this course as the EPBCA. Also, there's the uh, regulations that go with that act. They're from 2000. There is the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution, especially sections 51, which deals with powers, 52, which deals with Commonwealth places, and Section 109, which deals with the supremacy of Commonwealth law, where inconsistent with state law. From a prosecutorial perspective, the Commonwealth Criminal Code, which is set out in a schedule to the Commonwealth Code Act of 1995, um, is relevant. And in terms of review of decisions from an administrative perspective, the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 is also appropriate and uh, something to look at. So I'd recommend that you at least have a good, uh, have a, a cursory look at that material at this stage and progressively you'll need to, to have a more detailed look at the Environment Protection and Bio Biodiversity Conservation Act, EPBCA. From the Queensland perspective, um, the Sustainable Planning Act, um, which will be the Planning and Development Act, um, the Vegetation Management, Nature Conservation, Environmental Protection Act and the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act they're all worth a look at. Now, accessing this legislation for Commonwealth, either go through Ostley or through Comlaw, www.comlaw.gov.au. Comlaw is authorised. It provides up-to-date legislation. It provides information on recent changes to the law. There's a section where new and amended laws um, which attract community interest are included. There's information on how to use Comlaw, how to read legislation, commentary in relation to what lawmakers need to know. There's information about Gazette, announcements and information about bills. So there's a wealth of information on the Comlaw site. In Queensland, um, we have the Office of the Parliamentary Council. This is the authorised commentary. It's www.legislation.qld.gov.au. Uh, once again, it's up to date and it provides information about repealed legisla legislation and bills as well as current law. Also worth a look is Queensland Courts, www.courts.qld.gov.au. And very um, importantly for environmental law, there is a search facility available through eCourts where you can keep track of civil trials and you can actually look at party documentation. So I'm going to ask you to look at that and um, become familiar with it. Now, I've mentioned Ostley before, which is unauthorised, but still very popular. It does incorporate um, authorised reports. It has case law legislation, both Commonwealth and state. And it has some really good facilities. Firstly, the law site, that's L-A-W-C-I-T-E, search, facil search facility, where it's possible to see a particular case um, and where it's cited in other cases arranged across a range of jurisdictions. And also, and I use this a lot in practice, the note-up facility, 
um, which is in case law. So from the legislation, you can see a reference to case law, and from case law, you can see a reference to materials relevant to the case. So if, for example, you're looking at something in Queensland case law or Commonwealth case law, at the top of the banner, you'll see a, an area for note up, note up. Click on that and you'll see a list of decided cases relevant to that particular section. So that's a great service. Now, apart from that, um, I'd like you to have a look at courts websites. Many courts websites provide commentary in relation to reported and unreported decisions. So worth having a look at. And there are PDFs which are available on unreported decisions in many instances. Um, apart from that, I think you should um, have a, a look at Barnett Jade. And there's a facility there where you can uh, obtain information uh, on an up-to-date basis. And that's really worthwhile. Uh, that's a common and state and uh, provides daily updates through subscription. And it's free. All right, now, relevant courts and adjudicative bodies. In Queensland, the most important court for environmental law is the Queensland Planning and Environment Court. It has a number of functions. Firstly, it deals with planning appeals. Secondly, it has the power to make declarations. And thirdly, thirdly it has an enforcement function. Now, let's talk about those in a bit more detail. Firstly, the ability to deal with planning appeals. So someone, some council, for example, makes a decision in relation to an application and someone is not happy. What do they do? They should file a notice of appeal and that appeal is in the Planning and Environment Court. And it's pretty simple. It's um, XYZ appeals to the Planning and Environment Court at, say, Brisbane against, and what you do is set out the decision which is appealed against and then you set out what you seek, the orders or relief uh, that you seek. And then after you've set out what it is that you uh, wish to obtain, you set out the grounds of the appeal, and they're in paragraph numbers, and you set out what it is that you say about the decision, which is wrong. That is the uh, decision that's under appeal. So that's the first power, the very important power to deal with planning appeals. The second power of the Queensland Planning and Environment Court is to make declarations about planning and environment law matters. And in this instance, unlike a notice of appeal, the aggrieved party should file what's called an originating application. So the first one's an appeal. Second one, the one we're talking about now, is an application. And in terms of how it looks, it's XYZ applies to the Planning and Environment Court at, say, Brisbane, four and you set out the orders that you seek and then again like a notice of appeal in the originating application you set out the grounds uh, that you seek to rely upon and they're numbered uh, setting out each ground that you say is relevant for the court's consideration so that's the second type of um, um, application or second type of court matter before the PE court the third type is um, where the court has an enforcement function um, so, for example, in Fraser Coast Regional Council against Byrne Brothers PDY Ltd, Planning and Environment Court number 4926 of 2013, the council seeks an enforcement order pursuant to section 6011A of the Sustainable Planning Act 2009. And in that case, the court was asked to consider restraining the respondent from carrying out assessable development which was a material change of use from an extractive industry, unless and until conditions of development permit for the material change of use for the extractive industry uh, had been complied with. So you can see in that case that the court, the PE court, was asked to exercise its enforcement function, its ability to enforce conditions which were said to have been validly imposed upon a developer and not complied with. So they're the three different types of matters that you'll see in reported decisions for the PE court. Now, if you're involved in litigation in planning and environment court, you should file a notice of entry of appearance, or if you wish to become a co-respondent to an appeal or application, you file what's called a notice of election.
And um, in all instances, once the litigation is commenced, the court, that is the Planning and Environment Court, will inevitably order that parties should attend, participate and act reasonably and genuinely in mediation. And that will be conducted by an ADR registrar. Um, can I just say that the ADR system in the Planning and Environment Court has been recognised internationally as providing visionary ADR access to justice. And I quote from the District Court Annual Report from 2011-12. The um, ADR process generally is um, widely used in courts and tribunals now. And in my role as a member of um, the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, I can say that we receive the benefit of, of having many of the uh, type of ADR services which are used now in, say, the Planning and Environment Court in the context of QCAT. All right, so I've taken a bit of time talking about p and &E, uh, the p and &E Court, because it's simply very important in the context of planning and environment law. But there are other courts and tribunals that uh, do have a role to play in dealing with the adjudication of environmental law issues. Firstly, the Land Court. Uh, this has jurisdiction to deal with mining litigation disputes. Then we have the Magistrates Court and the District Court, which both have jurisdiction to determine criminal prosecutions of environmental law crimes. And they have the ability to deal with both um, alleged contraventions of state law and also alleged contraventions of Commonwealth law. So even though they're state courts, they do exercise this function of dealing with criminality associated with environmental law, both at a state and federal level. Apart from that, we have the Building and Development uh, Dispute Resolution Committee. Now, this is a body which is charged to determine certain disputes in relation to development applications. Largely, it deals with administrative issues. It was originally established as the Building and Development Tribunal, and it is conducted under the auspices of the Department of Housing and Public Works. It is a base level tribunal jurisdictional um, body and it is possible to appeal um, from this body to um, courts at a higher level. Now the application for an appeal or declaration before the um, BDDRC is to file a prescribed form of Form 10 and in that it might relate to appeals against a number of things. Firstly, it might deal with an appeal against a building matter. So you've got a building development application um, or you've got an, an enforcement notice under the um, Building Act or the Sustainable Planning Act. Uh, it might be an appeal against a decision by a building certifier or referral agency. In that instance, um, rather than go to the court, take it to the Building and Development Dispute Resolution Committee. Also, if you've got a problem in relation to a um, pool fencing certificate, a non-conformity notice, take it to that jurisdiction. The jurisdiction also deals with things like plumbing and drainage issues uh, or certificates, decisions about infrastructure charges, uh, which is section 535 of the Sustainable Planning Act, appeals against material change of use of prescribed buildings and appeals against compliance agencies or advice agencies. So they're all matters that might initially at least go to the Building and Development Dispute Resolution Committee. All right, we're nearly at the end, um, but I just want to say something about court rules. Don't um, forget to consider court rules in the context of litigation and uh, primarily the Planning and Environment Court rules of 2010, the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules of 1999, and various practice directions that will have a bearing on the conduct of litigation generally. Apart from that, I'll just mention in uh, uh, closing that while it's primarily a valuable, valuable resource in criminal law, I do have a look out for bench books, which are really a guide to courts as to how they might address um, litigants or juries, as the case may be, in the context of certain legal problems that might arise. Look, that will do me for now. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the course. Thank you. Bye.